So uh, thank you very much for organizing this workshop. It's very exciting to be here. Uh, this talk is about um, machine learning, using machine learning to assess exposure to uh, chemical mixtures in environmental health. And it's a transition between this session and the next session. You can think of it as way. We uh, heard a lot about mixtures uh, this morning. And there's a Greek saying that says repetition is the mother of learning, pun intending on the learning there. So um, hopefully this will not be too repetitive. So every day we're exposed to hundreds or maybe thousand chemicals. And traditional epidemiologic analysis has have focused on assessing uh, exposures at one chemical at a time. And this has worked well. We have identified with, through this process uh, known toxicants, and these, have, these studies have led to successful regulatory action. But the problem with that is that uh, this approach does not represent the reality. Uh, when I breathe in, I don't breathe just a single air pollutant, but I'm exposed to everything, the air pollution mixture that surrounds me. So I do need approaches that help me represent that better. Uh, there are also, we have high correlations. I might detect an association with one chemical. That doesn't mean that that chemical is a toxic one. It might be a chemical that's very well correlated with it. And also, if I run multiple regressions for every single chemical, they are severely increasing my chances of detecting spurious associations just due to chance. Uh, so the necessity to assess exposures to mixtures has been well recognized. Uh, EPA, NRC, NIH all have agreed there have been workshops uh, about this. Uh, in the morning, we've heard about the most recent NIHS workshop as well. And the million dollar question is, how can we represent the complexity of reality in a single statistical model? And that actually might mean different things to different people. Uh, before we go into any of this, the first question to ask is, well, what is a mixture? And there's no strict definition about what a mixture actually is. Uh, according to one NIHS statement, and I should say here this is not the official definition by NIHS, um, but a mixture must have at least three independent chemicals or chemical groups. And generally, exposure to mixture indicates exposure to multiple stressors simultaneously. And although I'm talking about chemicals, it's very important to highlight that mixtures are not only chemicals, but they do and we should uh, represent in our analysis, incorporate non-chemical stressors as well, such as socioeconomic status, the built environment, et cetera. The next most important thing when starting a mixtures analysis is what do we want to learn from that mixture? And depending on what research question we have, that will help us uh, select the most appropriate method for mixtures analysis. And there are several different potential questions that we might be interested in. This graph here shows uh, the five most um, commonly found of them. For example, I might need to know, I might want to know what's the toxic agent among or agents among my mixture members. I might want to know the overall mixture effect, uh, pattern recognition in my exposures. And depending on uh, a well-defined research question, I subsequently move on to uh, select an appropriate method for analysis. But it is challenging to analyze exposure to mixture. As we increase the chemicals or non-chemical stressors in our model, the dimensionality dramatically increases. We have very high correlation that could basically uh, blow up our models. So. Um, there's a very well-recognized need for novel and robust approaches, uh, emphasis on robustness, to assess exposure to mixtures, and then subsequently appropriate use of these approaches in health studies. Just to recap, there's an increasing need to incorporate complex and high-dimensional data in environmental health analysis. And uh, the approaches that are, have been conventionally used, you know, your linear regression, uh, logistic regression, are quite limited to help us do that. Enter machine learning. The uh, goal of machine learning is basically to learn from the data and perform predictions. Very simplified uh, way to put things. But because of this goal, machine learning approaches are very well positioned to accommodate high dimensionality and complexity in the data structures. And they can allow us to flexibly capture nonlinearities and interactions. And these are features that in environmental health we are very interested in, as uh, it was mentioned this morning. Also, because machine learning in the machine learning field, uh, most applications have massive amounts of data. 
uh, machine learning algorithms do strive for computational scalability and uh, keep improving. And as in environmental health, our data sets are also increasing, uh, both in uh, terms of the exposures we are assessing, but also in our study populations. The, there are studies now of millions of people. We do also need computationally scalable methods to perform our analysis. So incorporating machine learning in environmental health mixtures analysis is very, very promising. Uh, this is a somewhat complicated slide. This is, uh, these are some examples of mixture methods that have been already used. This is a slightly different uh, classification than the uh, Brammer uh, showed this morning. These now are classified by research question instead of what they are doing. Um, the important thing here to look at is not what all these methods are, but is that we have already been using machine learning methods in environmental health research. Many of these uh, PCA clustering, uh, lasso, elastic net, more recently uh, regression trees and random forest, we are already starting to use these methods and we are increasingly keeping up to date with the more advanced machine learning methods. But we should think before applying and using a machine learning method, we should keep in mind that the environmental health field has a different aim from the machine learning field. In environmental health, what we are mostly interested in is to understand how these environmental factors impact human health and characterize how confident we are in this understanding. On the other hand, machine learning aims to maximize predictive accuracy. And yes, if we understand the system that will help us maximize, predictive accuracy, but that is just one component of uh, the whole issue, and it's not necessarily always the first, uh, the most important one, the a prioritized one in machine learning. So why is this a problem? As we heard earlier, some methods do not, some machine learning methods do not provide standard errors or uncertainty estimates. And other methods do not provide beta that assumes linearity, of course, uh, associations might be nonlinear, and we might be able to extract exposure response functions, but in some methods, these do depend on the model parameterization. This doesn't mean that all methods have these limitations, all machine learning methods, and in fact, as one of my projects, we are turning to Bayesian machine learning for comprehensive characterization on uncertainty of on air pollution exposures. But it, I'm just saying this to highlight the fact that we need to be very cautious when adopting machine learning algorithms. We need to make sure that these methods do what we want them to do. So we might need to tweak, adapt, or extend existing methods to make them more appropriate for use in environmental health. And uh, this is best done with collaboration with machine learning experts and biostatisticians. So this goes back to, the, <laughs> to Brammer's equation. The collaboration here now have the hat of the environmental epidemiologist, but this could be in any applied field, basically. It could be toxicology, it could be other um, environmental health subfields. It's also very important to be able to incorporate prior knowledge in our health analysis, population health analysis, I should say. So if there are methods that allow us to incorporate prior knowledge from toxicological studies, this should be prioritized. And uh, we've heard this several times already in most talks. The focus should be on interpretable and robust results. Uh, I will go over one example uh, for use of machine learning in uh, environmental health. Uh, this uh, is about robust exposure pattern recognition. Pattern, exposure pattern recognition is one of the potential research questions that we might have. And if we identify um, sources of exposure or common behavior of patterns in my population, my study population, then and subsequently in health analysis identify the harmful sources or harmful behaviors, then that can help me inform policy or our results of these studies can help inform policy and design interventions. So uh, this project that I will be talking about, uh, the aim was to adapt a robust pattern recognition method for use in environmental health and extend this method for more flexible use based on EH needs specifically. The method I will be presenting is called Principal Component Pursuit. This method was co-developed by John Wright, who is uh, at uh, Columbia, and it's a powerful method for data dimensionality reduction and pattern recognition. 
It was uh, developed as a signal processing method developed initially in the computer vision field uh, for face recognition and video surveillance. Its applications have seen increased and uh, with some recent use even medical imaging, which is more relevant, I guess, to our fields. And the goal of this method is to decompose the data matrix, the exposure matrix, into two different matrices, the low rank uh, matrix and low rank matrix that can help us identify, pull out consistent patterns in my population, whether these are sources or common behaviors, but also interestingly a sparse matrix. And the sparse matrix can be used to identify unique or extreme events. In most epi studies, we tend to discard this because they mess up our results, but there could be very useful information in these um, unique exposure events that are actually relevant to the health output, uh, outcome that we are studying. Uh, PCP is robust to noisy and corrupt data. It's not influenced by outlying values. It comes with theoretical guarantees and requires minimal assumptions, and there are no tuning parameters. Or this is an overstatement. There are tuning parameters, but the default parameters are actually uh, working uh, very well for the most part. This is a PCP example from video surveillance. Uh, on your, uh, you can think of each row is a frame from video, and on your left-hand side, this column is the original uh, video uh, frames, are the original video frames. The middle column shows the low rank matrix uh, results, and these are the consistent patterns from frame to frame. And you can see that um, this picked out perfectly the background of these videos. So you can think of, in this case, the patterns are uh, the, I, this is a mall, so I don't know this bar, wait, I have, yes, the bar here, the column, the floor, the trash can, these are consistent patterns. You can think of uh, applying this and obtaining exposure consistent patterns in our population. The last column on your right-hand side, that, these are the results from the sparse matrix. What the sparse matrix picked out was the random movement of people in front of the camera. These are the unique events that still, though, provide important information about this scene that if we discard, we are missing a big part of this video. So the idea is, OK, this would, works fantastic for video surveillance. Can we apply it? in uh, environmental health settings. Uh, in fact, this is a larger project, and the idea is to uh, use PCP, adapt PCP for environmental health applications specifically. Right now, we are working on um, a non-negative solution for PCP, so we can have more interpretable results in terms of concentrations. For example, we want to allow PCP to help us deal better with values below the limit of detection, which is a huge thing in um, environmental epidemiology and how to deal with this. And the next steps are to extend PCP uh, to make it more flexible for different applications in environmental health and environmental um, epidemiology. The most exciting one uh, is to allow uh, incorporation of prior knowledge if we have anything, both in terms of if I know something about my mixture and what patterns I would expect, or also if I have any toxicological information. Um, assess we, uh, I want to assess performance of this method and compare it with other methods, see if we improve uh, our abilities by using this method over others. And then finally, uh, develop and share an open source software so people can benefit uh, by use of this application. And the general idea is that we, if this works and works well, we want people to be able to apply this method in their applications in environmental health. So as a proof of concept, we uh, wanted to use PCP for uh, air pollution ICOM. I'm an air pollution epidemiologist, so this is my world, uh, to a data set that uh, has been very well characterized and that I have worked a lot with to see how it works. Uh, so this is a source apportionment study uh, using air pollution data from Boston between 2003 and 2010. We used information on daily fine particles, black carbon, and I think 16 or 17 uh, fine particle components, and these were all measured at the Harvard Super site. So um, I will not go over all the results. This is just one example. This is uh, the results for the low rank ma matrix now. These uh, components, the resulting components, could be interpreted as sources. 
we saw very good agreement in the PCP results compared to other methods that have been more uh, traditionally used for source apportionment, like positive matrix factorization and absolute principal component analysis. The example I'm showing here is the original and secondary particles. And you can see we have very uh, good uh, contributions of uh, sulfate and black carbon in that source. That's exactly what we would have expected. This source accounts for about 50% of the PM2.5 uh, mass concentration in Boston. Again, that's uh, what we would expect. Uh, the other sources also perform well. We identify traffic, crustal uh, particles, residual oil combustion, some salt, and some road dust. So far, so good. What's even more exciting is the um, sparse matrix. So um, in, on May 1st, uh, 31st, sorry, in 2010, a plume of wildfires that originated in Canada was passing through Boston and was a very... Um, I was there at the time, and you could really feel it. And it was, it's very interesting to see that uh, PCP was actually able to uh, pick that up. On the, uh, this is the rep visual representation of the sparse matrix. On the x-axis are all the different uh, components, particle components that we included. And on the y-axis are the different dates. And as you can see, on May 31st, I have this, on May 31st, we saw very high contributions of black carbon, that is an, uh, a general combustion product, but also potassium, uh, that is uh, a biomass burning um, surrogate uh, tracer. So uh, this day, in all other methods, would have been thrown out because it would have messed the PCA, if PCA was using solution. Uh, but here we can uh, use this information and it could be relevant to, for example, emergency cardiovascular admissions or emergency respiratory admissions. Uh, so in conclusion, um, machine learning uh, is especially advantageous for mixtures analysis, but we need to proceed with caution. We need to uh, understand what the method is supposed to be doing. Am I actually interested in what this method is doing? Or is it just a cool method that I want to use? Which is not how exactly we should proceed. So we need to be cautioned, and it works best in collaboration with machine learning experts and biostatisticians. So um, especially for methods that are now popping up, it's good to sit down, uh, form a team, and discuss how we can best apply these methods for environmental health needs. And uh, I cannot emphasize enough the uh, need to focus on robust and interpretable results for, that will increase consistency across studies, that will help us understand what's going on so we can best understand the biological mechanism, we can best inform uh, policy and regulatory action. So interpretable and robust results can help us guarantee actionable results, and that's uh, what we are going for. Um, this was, I go, went over one example of what, how we can use machine learning uh, for mixtures analysis. Another example is coming up uh, at the hands-on session today at 4. So um, this should be very exciting. I'm looking forward to that. So stay tuned for that uh, by the Duke group. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, John Wright is uh, uh, my collaborator who co-developed PCP. And Jeff Goldsmith is um, the biostatistician we are working with uh, to help us um, apply PCP in environmental health data. Uh, we also have uh, environmental health experts, epidemiologists, and a toxicologist in the team to make sure that we understand uh, what's going on. I would like to thank my students, because they are doing all the work. I just get to sit here and talk about it. Uh, and also uh, my mentors, uh, who have helped me um, through um, thinking about mixtures for, for a while now. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. I guess we have one minute left.